Good evening, everyone. If you're won wondering where there are seats, there are some down towards the front. So please fill in, make sure you're comfy, everyone can uh, get settled. So yeah, my name is Michelle Totolo. I'm a lead software engineer over at Capital One in San Francisco. And I work on our main Capital One application. Uh, for iOS, there's also one for Android. And today, I'm here to talk about making friendly microservices. But before we get started with the real meat of the talk, there's something I really want to cover. That is, what is the definition of a microservice? It's this term that's been thrown around through this conference, through other conferences, through news outlets. So I just want to make sure everyone here is on the same page. So for the rest of this talk, this is what a microservice is. A microservice is a small service that does one thing well. Microservices are independent. And most importantly, microservices own their own data. So keep this in mind as we go through the rest of the talk. Now again, another word, friendly. Friendly microservices, that's what we're talking about today. And it turns out friendly is a word that has a lot of different meanings. It's a word that's evolved to mean many different things in the English language. And I'm sure other languages have different words for these, but we only have one in English. So the definition of friendly that we're going to use today is helpful, an ally, kind, easy to use and understand, and lastly, able to coexist without causing harm. Now, what I'm actually going to be covering today is what makes a microservice helpful? What makes a microservice an ally, kind, easy to use, and able to coexist? Now, you're probably wondering, why do we care about friendly microservices? Well, you all probably read the talk description where I was like, I'm going to talk about different consumers and how they have needs and all of these tools. There's going to be plenty of tools. But as I was making this talk, I realized that the needs of ops, the needs of peer developers, the needs of consumers of your microservices actually all overlap. And they can be much better defined by going through those helpful, kind, and ally, all of those pieces, and just explaining it overall how to make a great microservice for everyone, while still covering some things specific to the different kinds of people that use your microservice. So, what makes a microservice helpful? This is going to be a great surprise, so ready? <laughs> the number one thing you can do to make your microservice helpful is writing really good documentation. And this isn't just API documentation. This is way more than that. Version and revision history. I don't know how many times I've gone to use a new microservice, use a new API, and for some reason, I need to use version 3 when version 4 is the most recent, but I can't find the version 3 documentation. Or you've implemented something and shipped, and there's a bug all of a sudden, and you need that older piece of documentation, and it's not around anymore. So historical records of why and when are extremely important, not just for people using your API, but also operations. Um, one thing that's going to keep coming up today is the fact that microservices exist in a larger ecosystem. So it's never just about one microservice. It's about the interconnected network of services providing some end benefit to consumers and customers. So this is really important for ops as well, because they also need to know when things changed. Another piece of documentation is, that is really useful is live documentation. This is specifically around APIs. So being able to hit an API from a website, get a JSON response, make sure the request parameters are correct, makes it really easy for other people to start using your microservices, while at the same time, basically gives you a playground to double check if this edge case is being handled. Is the date being passed from another web service into your microservice being formatted correctly? A really big theme around Docker this year is dependencies and being able to manage a whole swarm of clusters of services. So having really good documentation around what are your dependencies, including what version they are, versioning's huge, um, is really important. And why? Well, when dependencies aren't documented, it ends up causing a lot of confusion and frustration. There's 
countless numbers of people involved making microservices stay up, creating a healthy ecosystem, and ultimately troubleshooting issues when something inevitably goes down. So having that information in an easy to find place really helps with this. So create a dependency graph. Um, there used to be this lovely command, docker image dash dash tree, um, that got removed in Docker 1.7. Um, there's a GitHub project that now lets you do it, which I have referenced later in a resources slide. So Docker can help you do that with the addition of this lovely new tool. Otherwise, you do have to do it manually. And if you're not using containers, obviously you need to do this manually. Auto-generating documentation. As part of the release pipeline, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to use a new service and the documentation hasn't been updated. It was deployed, it was out there, ready to use, and you're just like, but I'm getting different responses back. It's not accepting the query parameters correctly. So creating this as part of your release pipeline helps out anyone who wants to use your service. Now, what are some tools around this? So there are lots of API documentation tools around there. The three that I'm most familiar with are the Open API spec, most of the tools of which are known as Swagger, um, API Blueprint, and RAML. Open API spec lets you specify your API, your, your gets, puts, posts, parameters, uh, response types, status codes, error messages, all of that sort of stuff. And this is in a very machine readable way. So there are libraries out there that help you validate that this is a valid API. API, bl API Blueprint, same kind of topic. But this one's markdown based, so I found it's a lot easier to integrate into your actual code base so that it's a lot nicer when you're looking at a method, you can see the API output from it. RAML's a YAML based format, um, pretty similar to the other ones, but the tools in these different ecosystems are very different. So if you're going to look at using one of these different specification formats, basically, Take a look at the tools. They're very different. Some of them are more enterprise focused. Some of them are more Ruby and JavaScript focused. So pick whichever one's right for you. Now, what can a microservice do to be an ally? Please integrate monitoring tools. <laughs> monitoring tools are so important in a microservice ecosystem, especially once you get really heavily dependent networks, which is just generally what happens over time. In large interconnected systems, monitoring is the best way to prevent large system-wide failures. Log all of the things. This is a huge, huge thing because in really big systems, you need to know what's going on. Sometimes you can't always reproduce what's going on. Um, so logging all of the requests and responses, not necessarily in production, that's probably not great, but in a staging or development environment, you definitely want to do this. And a thing that I've seen work really, really well is to have individual request identifiers. So when you're going back through your logs, you have a like 32 character alphanumeric string. You can just look back and see that exact request response, see the problems. Red light, green light. What is red light, green light? So how many of you have services that Whenever something goes wrong, they just kind of turn it off and turn it back on again, and then turn it off and then turn it back on again, and then turn it off and turn it back on again. That's what red light, green light is to me. And while this is great for keeping things going, it's not great for finding the underlying issues, because chances are there's a reason your server stops responding after three days. There's a reason why the Java crashed every Monday morning, which is actually something I've had to deal with, and it's not fun. So having really good documentation, having really good monitoring tools, and collecting metrics, which I'll cover some tools later, around your services really helps you fine tune the servers and get everything up and running. Another really important part of monitoring is what happens when one of your services fails. What happens when one of your dependencies fail? Hint, your service should not go down. This seems really basic, but in a lot of big systems, there are a couple nodes that end up having the majority of traffic, the majority of needs of other consumers. So those end up being some sort of local maximum where if those goes down, there's this tire like outage, nothing works, and it's just absolutely terrible. 
So being able to surface errors before something goes down, when CPU's getting you know, above 90%, when latency's getting over you know, 500 milliseconds, is really important for preventing these kinds of problems. And what I tend to do with my services is, is have macro dependencies, the things that absolutely positively are required for my service to function, but then like little micro ones, like a thumbnailer service is a great example of something that's a little dependency. I can say, hey, make a thumbnail of this image. I don't really care when you finish. I don't really care what happens afterwards, but just, just do it. And it's okay if you're down for like an hour. That, I can handle that fine. But macro dependencies are really, really big, things that are really important to your application, and having that documented is really important. Working closely with ops and other microservice creators is imperative to creating a healthy ecosystem. If you are using a new dependency, and that dependency gets called every time your app gets called, someone else needs to know that. If all of a sudden you're calling another dependency twice as much as you're getting called, the people who build that and the people who maintain that also need to know that because they're going to need to deal with the increased traffic. And this comes down to two things, the first of which is communication. Microservices communicate with each other. The people building microservices also need to communicate with each other and make sure that everyone's aware of what's going on. Does this one call actually end up calling 72 services behind the firewall? That's actually really important to know when you're integrating it. So finding ways to communicate in large organizations is hard. But don't worry, it can happen because the other thing that you can do is gathering data. So data around how many services depend on how many other services, how frequently are services being called from other services, how many dependencies are affected, even if your service is only getting hit a little bit more, how many other dependencies in the ecosystem are also having that same problem and those same bottlenecks. And there are some really great tools around this. So thankfully, there are a lot of really great companies out there working to make this easier. Docker, for one, welcome to DockerCon, I'm talking about Docker. Um, it is a great way to manage dependencies. Docker Compose is a fantastic tool. It's kind of like the underdog that nobody talks about, but is really, really fantastic. And the new Swarm and Scale stuff will really make your life easier when you're deploying clusters of servers or servers that depend on other servers. You can make that really explicit, and you should make that really explicit when you're using containers. Atlas. Okay, I'm just going to quote what the website says, and then I'm going to explain it. <laughs> Atlas is the system Netflix uses to manage dimensional time series data for near real-time operational insight. It's a lot of big words, but what it essentially means is Atlas is a metric server specifically geared towards microservices. So you can send it latency, you can send it the number of requests you've received, you can send it CPU usage, and it can handle really, really large volumes of data and provide you with real-time insight into what servers are getting hit right now, you know, how is that affecting the rest of the grid? And um, of course, this is available as a container. And the last tool that I'll briefly cover is Zipkin. It is a dis distributed tracing system, so it has a little SDK that resides on each service, and it actually helps you troubleshoot latency problems throughout your entire microservice ecosystem. This obviously is a little bit more invasive than just like a metric server that you hit with an API. But at the end of the day, you do need that external metrics of the service reporting out what's happening, as well as the internal metrics and being really able to understand what's happening on each individual box. And Zipkin helps with that latter problem. What makes a microservice kind? Make your service easy to deploy and scale. Don't use complicated build scripts. Don't manually require copying and pasting files. Make sure regardless of who is running operations, who is the one deploying your server, that you can restart it, you can scale it up, you can even scale it down if all of a sudden you have 10 boxes just sitting there not being used. Consumers should be able to hit the API in a non-prod environment. Microservices tend to be kind of all the way removed and like there's this weird IP address you have to know with the weird port you have to know. 
you still need to make that accessible even if you're exposing your microservice in a different way because as you create these large interconnected systems, you're taking data from microservice A and funneling it into microservice B and sometimes microservice A has a different date format than microservice B so you need to double check that those are working correctly. And at the end of the day, all of these services are being consumed by other services or end users. So it just needs to play well with the ecosystem and this is a really important way to make that happen. Consistent error messaging. Error messages are great in theory, but not when you're not servicing the right intent, like the, not, the right state of what's going on. There are lots of different errors that you can get when you're dealing with microservices than with a triple, like a typical monolithic app you only have a certain amount of error messages. Usually you have data or you don't have data. The service is up or it's down, and that's pretty much it. User's not logged in, another one. Those are kind of the really basic use cases. But as soon as you get into the microservice world where you're hitting one API and it has to call two other APIs to get data, this gets a lot more complicated. This is one of the reasons why I absolutely love the HTTP status code 206, partial content. Look at using it if you've never heard of it. Um, this is explicitly created to handle the use case where only some of the requested data can be returned, but not all of it. But why is this important? Well, I've done a lot of work on mobile, and I can tell you that 400 and 500 level error codes usually have an entirely separate code path because those are like, oh man, there's something wrong. We need to tell the user, like, something needs to change, and you don't want that to happen when you actually have some data. This does require clients to be a little smarter, do a little bit more parsing. But at the end of the day, it's a better experience because even though we are creating just one little tiny microservice in a large forest of services, someone's going to be using that. There's gonna be data exposed to an internal customer, external customer, whoever, and you want them to have a good experience. Do not make others set up a development environment to troubleshoot issues. If you have really good logging, this isn't a, usually an issue. But, you know, sometimes things got built a while ago and they just kind of sat there because you're like GE and you have 9,000 different services. And so someone needs to figure out what's going on. And this is where containers or any other sort of auto configuration scripts that you have along with your service make it really easy for other people to just hop in and fix things without needing to spend three days sitting next to a computer with someone else who worked on this thing like three years ago. Some tools, of course, Docker is a big piece of this because containers, we're at a container conference, so every service should stand alone, have its own container. Docker Compose for dependencies, as I already mentioned. Um, Swarm and scale, also great, especially for testing microservice clusters on your local machine because everyone should be using containers for local development. This is something that I've started to bring up internally, but also other people I talk to are always like, oh, it'd be really great to test these three services out together, but one's in Java and two are in Ruby, but there's like this Node.js caching layer and it's just this really complicated thing to set up. But if you're using containers, someone can just pull down your image get it running, and you can start troubleshooting issues or making updates as needed. Jenkins is everyone's continuous integration, continuous, in, well, at least my continuous integration, continuous deployment, maybe not deployment all the time, tool of choice. It's Jenkins 2 adds a whole bunch of new features and a really, really slick UI. Um, so definitely look at checking that out because it's just kind of a powerhouse. You can have it do pretty much everything that you can do as a human, and you can just have it do it all the time. And then automate your deploys. I've done a lot of Ruby work, so I've worked a lot with Capistrano, but there's Chef, there's all of these other configuration, deploy management automation tools. Um, they're ones usually in your language of choice. My language of choice is Ruby, so this is the one that I use. What makes a microservice easy to use? One base URL for everything, please. This is more of a deployment issue where when you're working internally, you might not know this because you might just be hitting DNS numbers or with certain ports, certain paths. But where does your service live in the greater ecosystem? How do people access it? 
how does it get accessed outside the firewall? And at the end of the day, consumers shouldn't really ultimately care about any of this. They shouldn't know that they're hitting a microservice. And why? Because it's an implementation detail. We're programmers, we're DevOps engineers, we don't like leaky abstractions. And exposing the fact that your microservice is separate from other services is just kind of a waste of everybody's time. So use an API gateway or load balancer to route your API calls. And there's another reason why one URL is also really, really important, and that's because of security. I work for a bank, hello. We work with people's money. It's very important that we be secure. Um, so security, being security conscious lets you obfuscate all of the details of your backend systems, so it's a little bit harder for people to tell what's going on. Now with cookies, we all love cookies, so does Cookie Monster, um, but doing things like not using wildcards, always use HTTPS, um, and setting the correct domain. Um, last week, Apple had their big WWDC developer conference, and they announced that of iOS 10, Every single app that ships to the App Store has to be using HTTPS. Your app will be rejected from the App Store starting in the fall if you're not using HTTPS. It turns out security is a really big deal. And there's a reason for that, and the reason is men in the middle attacks on mobile are extremely common. We've all seen people like putting their own servers in between like Snapchat or Tinder and just getting users' locations, getting their addresses, personal information. It's really terrible. So mobile security is huge. And part of that is SSL certificate pinning. If you're working with people who make apps and they don't do this, they should be doing this. Um, it basically just validates that the certificate that the app is expecting is the one that it's getting from the server. And this requires a consistent domain because your SSL certificate obviously has to be tied to a specific domain. Um, in the world that I live in, having a different one for your regular domain versus your API is also really great because then if one gets compromised, you can still keep the other service up. More tools, because there are so many things that help with this. Again, Docker, we have Swarm, we have Scale, we had all of these things that were announced yesterday. This is a brand new slide, even though it's an exact copy of the other one. Um, but Docker is gonna be really great for helping scale and manage clusters. Zool is an API gateway that is yet again out of Netflix. They're doing some really amazing things with open source. Um, and this is the one that my team uses for API gateway monitoring security. And it kind of is the big powerhouse that drives the ability for us to create custom experiences depending on the different mobile clients that we have. Um, there's a blog post that goes into more detail about this that I'll reference later. Um, we have our lovely load balancers, Nginx is Really, really big one. They're downstairs, I saw. So walk over, ask them some questions if they could help you solve things. They do all of the really basic load balancing, routing kind of stuff. And then if you're a little bit simpler, HA proxy is a much simpler, much lower, smaller scale way of doing load balancing and routing. But if you're just starting out, this is a lot easier. I mean, at least for me, it was a little bit easier to grok than something as complicated as Nginx. Lastly, what makes APIs able to coexist? How do APIs coexist? Well, it really comes down to consistency and conventions because we're working in large ecosystems these days. We're working with hundreds, possibly thousands of different services. And how do you keep them all consistent? How do you keep them all up? How do you keep them all healthy? So you really need to figure out how does your service fit in with the rest of them. Does your service do too much? Does your service do too little? You don't want to be looking at this giant forest of microservices and there's one tree that towers above the rest because chances are that tree goes down and all the other trees around it go down too and you don't want that. Services also need to work together because microservices are doing one thing and doing that one thing really well, but it is very rare that the end products you're building only need that one thing. They need all of the things. So they need to make sure that you're sending back the same keys for the same objects. They need to make sure you're consistent with all your date formats and how you're doing 
Booleans that are using JSON true or is someone sending zero and one? Don't send zero and one, by the way, that's not good. Don't take single responsibility too far. We love talking about breaking up monolithic applications into smaller pieces. But sometimes there are pieces that are just so interconnected that making that dividing line just doesn't really happen. So find the right places to separate out your services. And if two services are just really super duper chatty and they're always talking back and forth together, first of all, that's gonna be an ops nightmare because if one of them goes down, the other one goes down. But also, it just creates way more traffic and it's just way more complicated. So find the right things. Um, I got my career started doing mobile development and as a consultant for mobile, you were using APIs that were usually built for something else. So there would be times when they would only accept the uh, text plane header for JSON. They would still parse it as JSON, but they'd be text plane. There are times when they would send back a 200 status code with like error in the response body. So every single time you got a response from the server, you had to check if there was an error key that had text, because if there wasn't an error, it would send an empty string. You never know what your service is going to be used for at the end of the day. So you should follow conventions. There are standards that exist for a reason. And so you need to build it with the idea that you can use it for more than one thing. So what this comes down to is assumptions. Does your service expect the user to be logged in? This is a really big one, because there are a lot of services that are just providing data these days. It's not necessarily user focused. So if all of a sudden your service starts getting used and no one's logged in, what's going to happen? And this comes back to documentation again. So what are some tools? This one's a little bit tricky because unlike all of the other things I've covered, this requires significantly more human reasoning and people actually going through and making sure that things look the same. Some of this can be automated with checking your API documentation to make sure the same date stamp is being used everywhere. Um, but what this really comes down to is microservice discovery. Finding out who's doing what, where are they doing it, can they help you with what you're doing? Um, and that usually ends up leading to API discovery. Now there's a couple open source tools. I've used some proprietary tools around developer portals or API gateways internally. Just find one that works for you. Um, there are a lot of proprietary ones, which is why I didn't put them up on the slides because I haven't used any of the proprietary ones. Um, but finding ways to let people see what you're doing and make it easy for them to get started with your service is going to make it a healthier ecosystem. So, to sum up, what makes a friendly microservice? A friendly microservice has helpful documentation that is updated frequently, revision history, what changed and why. Friendly microservice is built with monitoring and troubleshooting in mind. Um, I was in another talk this morning that said, we no longer build services with the expectation that they're always going to be up. They're built with the expectation that things are eventually going to fail. And we need to be able to handle that in a reliable and consistent way that doesn't provide any significant downtime or any significant degradation in user experience to our customers. Friendly microservices are easy to deploy, easy to scale, easy for anyone on the team to go through and say, hey, we need 10 more boxes. Uh, without necessarily needing to know the itty bitty little nitty gritty details about how your service works. Friendly microservice is easy to consume because at the end of the day, if you want people using your service, they need to know how to use it. They need to know when is the appropriate time to use it. They need to know what assumptions you're making about where they are coming from. And lastly, your microservice needs to be able to coexist in a larger ecosystem, and it needs to fit in. That doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be exactly the same. We want to make sure that microservices are doing really great work, but it's still, don't be the biggest tree in the forest. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.
right, so we have about 15, 14 and a half minutes for questions. Um, certainly, if you need to get somewhere else, feel free to leave. Just be polite to your neighbors. Um, so we can take some questions. Raise your hand. I'll pass the mic to you. You're wearing orange, so that's... Thank you very much for this good presentation about microservices. I have a comment regarding the communication between microservices. Mm -hmm. You refer mostly, and not just you, most of the people do HTTP, yep. RESTful, but there is much more like oh, message-based and oh, TCP yeah. and UDP. And it still needs documentation. It. So regardless of how you're communicating, whether it's your own custom format, whether it's sockets, TCP, UDP, you still need that same level of documentation. And if you can, still provide really easy tools, even if it's like a curl command that, user, that anyone can just copy paste into a terminal and hit the service, see what's happening, inspect it. It's all about the tooling and making it easy for other people to interact with your service in addition to all of the documentation. Because as we all know, it's really great to automate documentation, but that doesn't always happen. So yeah, there's definitely a lot more tools. I've mostly worked with APIs that are REST-based. Michelle, quick question. What are the names of your pugs? <laughs> They're not actually my pugs. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't have pets. I have a plant, and I've kept it alive for six months, and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I'm not going to ask about your doggies. Um, given that you work in a bank, um, how much of what you're describing here is empowered for the local teams that do the microservices development, and how much is mandated by your enterprise governance bodies? Yeah, Capital One has very much a you build it, you own it kind of mentality. Um, there's been a general trend moving towards microservices, but at the end of the day, we are a bank. We can't move everything to the cloud. Um, we're always, I mean, that's the thing that's been communicated out to me, at least. I don't make these decisions, but we're still going to have some things that are never able to be in the cloud. So it's more about enabling developers to do their best work and provide the best customer experiences, um, which is what I work on is really interesting because we're an orchestration layer that takes all of those really data-based APIs and creates what we call experience APIs. So everyone's empowered to do what they want. We do make certain microservices that have specific needs, but at the end of the day, we're all working for the better of the customer and people are really empowered to make the decisions that they think are gonna be best for them. That was a great talk. Um, one of the things that, that we're really focused on and trying to figure out is how to do troubleshooting in the production environment effectively without standing up those development environments. And we're a fintech company, so we have a single jump host that you can get into the environment in, so that becomes pretty complicated. I was hoping you might elaborate on that for us. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of monitoring and a lot of logging in place in our production environments, but we spend a significant amount of time doing our troubleshooting in QA, in a QA environment that mimics our production environment as close as we can, because we do extra encryption layers, like SSL pinning is a pain to work around. If you've ever tried to troubleshoot uh, like a mobile application to a server that has SSL pinning, it's basically impossible. So what we've mostly tried to do is get our pre-prod environments as close to production as possible, and then have all of the tooling in place, and then as soon as we start seeing issues, figuring out how to reproduce it in a way that we can actually reproduce it. Because at the end of the day, we don't necessarily want to be going in and looking at real customer data. That's, that's not really okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, it was a great talk. Um, we embrace microservices in my company um, to the, fullest extent that we possibly can. Our biggest challenge is how do the microservices own their own data? There was a talk yesterday with Chris Richardson um, who mentioned event sourcing, and I'm starting to wrap my head around that, but I'm always looking for all of our developers want to put everything into one database because it's really easy to back up, um, but there are challenges and cons with that, and we it's like the last hurdle that we really want to embrace is how do you make it so the microservices own their own data um, in a simple way. Yeah, I mean, that's really finding the correct lines. So if you have, a, I don't know, an e-commerce site, I've done a lot of e-commerce work. Um, for instance, if you wanted to have user preferences, there's, that doesn't necessarily need to be in the same database as the customer's cart. 
So finding those correct lines, there's always going to be some things that are together. But finding the right lines where you can get the data you need from another service and then use it, use it even sometimes a foreign key from a different database, which is not the best way to do it, but that's the best thing that I've really found. Um, you don't necessarily also want to do one model, one service, because again, you have those interconnected things. So look at your data. If it is really that highly relational, you're probably gonna have, you're just gonna continue to have that problem. So then I'd say, figure out what you can break out. Figure out what really isn't that coupled, and you might just need an identifier. Um, a lot of our microservices do use some sort of uh, account identifier, and we can call multiple different services with that same identifier. They all serve different kinds of data, and at the end of the day, I don't actually know where that data is stored, but I, can, I know I can pass that identifier around, and everyone knows how to handle it. So finding ways to do that is probably going to be your best bet. Hi. Um <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, do you have some best practice suggestions around uh, authentication and authorization between the microservices talking to each other? Currently, we have a firewall, and behind the firewall, anybody can talk to any any service. And then sometimes we DDoS ourselves, and we couldn't <laughs> figure out which microservice is, is yeah. hitting which. Yeah. Um, being, like being able to trace your requests with those unique request IDs will definitely help that, first of all, because then you can actually see the path of requests as it courses through your system. Um, a lot of it, like, our pre-prod environments are very different than our prod environments, and our pre-prod environments are very open, <laughs> but it's all test data, so, you know, not really as much. But a lot of it does have to do with um, API keys. We use those extensively um, to make sure that there's, there's keep, People are keeping track of what application is hitting what. Um, and those are very much a simple solution, but at the end of the day, you do want, in those cases where you're trying to track through something like an API key header um, or just one of these other tools um, that can actually inspect your different stack, and um, Zipkin does this kind of, you can um, just have it log things for you. So. API keys, and then see what other tools are available that kind of help you trace with that. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, we have another round of applause for an excellent talk. Thank you.